Hey all, how's it going? My name is Jacob, and welcome to tonight's interactive stargazing. I have a nice list of stuff that I'd like to go through this evening, but first, let me just do a little bit of an introduction and just a, a little bit of a disclaimer. Uh, the disclaimer being that tonight it's just a little bit windy up on Mars Hill. It might make imaging a little bit more difficult than it needs to be, but nevertheless, we're gonna do our very best to get the best photographs possible. And always feel free to use the chat to uh, tell us about things. And if you have any requests about objects that you personally would like to see, uh, feel free to shoot them in chat and we will do our best to image them for you. That's if they're available for viewing. Tonight, we are going to be using the 17 inch plane wave. On the back of it is attached a Malincam DS10C Tech. That's all fancy for just a camera that's gonna take some really pretty photos for us. And, uh, what better place to start off than with the beautiful galaxy known as M87. This is an incredibly large and massive galaxy located just outside of the constellation Virgo. It is just around 53.5 million light years in distance away from us here at home. And it holds a special place in my heart. That's why I'm starting with it. So uh, we are starting off with an exposure. We're gonna see what our first image will look like. And there, smack dab in the middle of that image is uh, what appears to be the faint glow of just this beautiful, uh, almost looks like a headlight through a galactic fog. That is the galaxy M87. Again, it's pretty far away, being 53.5 million light years in distance, uh, makes it an incredible sight for anybody to be able to see. Telescopes like this 17 inch do a fantastic job of seeing galaxies like this. And uh, well, there's a little bit of a special story behind M87. Even though to this photographs and uh, really just everybody's eyes, it doesn't look like too much besides just a blob, uh, there is something special about it that happened uh, recently rather. Uh, this here is a photograph of a supermassive black hole, or rather the supermassive black hole of M87. It is uh, quite a sight, and it took a while for people to really convince themselves that like black holes uh, were actually out there, physically out there. Uh, but once everybody kind of got everything all settled, uh, humankind figured that they would try to take a photo. And uh, well, just very recently, uh, last year, this photograph was taken and it's quite amazing as you can see uh, there is not a whole lot to it it's very pixelated it, it's not as high def as you could try to imagine you know i, I guess modern day stuff could uh, uh could could return to us but it's it's still very interesting to see uh, just you know how uh, crazy this all looks and uh, this is a monster of a supermassive black holes. And supermassive black holes are usually pretty massive to begin with, hence the name. Uh, but this residing in the center of M87, an already massive galaxy, uh, is proportional to its galaxy's size. So this thing is uh, pretty amazing, not only to look at, uh, but with every little implication it brings. Now, next up on our list is something, and actually one of my personal favorites again, uh, known as M13. It is a globular star cluster in the constellation of Hercules, and the objects, or really just objects, uh, lie at about an average of 22,000 light years away from home. Now, this object was discovered in 1714, but was later cataloged by Messier himself. And uh, this whole catalog was developed to uh, basically find objects in the night sky or help identify objects that looked similar to uh, comets or looked like comets and distinguish them. So whenever people would look up at the sky and see these objects, they could, they could uh, take a peek through a telescope, check the catalog, the, the location. And uh, if there was a Messier object supposed to be in that location, well, then that's, that's not a comet. You know, it's, it's something that... Uh, you know, that they don't have to worry about because these people were really interested in what were comets or what weren't comets. Uh, but nevertheless, this catalog proved to be very, very uh, useful and, and special for astronomers because it made it very easy to find certain objects out there that were really fun to look at and just uh, really easy to locate and great for 
any form of amateur astronomy. Now, M13 is another one of my favorite objects because it uh, has a lot of neatness to it as well. Uh, similar to M87, it's it's more or less just in this uh, elliptical form, but it's it's pulling itself into a globular shape, hence the name. And uh, this cluster of stars contains uh, hundreds of thousands of, of stars that, well, seem to outage something like our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, these star clusters formed quite a long time ago. And uh, given this time, they have more or less been incorporated into our Milky Way and uh, brought into our family where uh, nowadays a lot of them do reside on uh, usually the edge of our own Milky Way or a little bit further away than what we would be accustomed to. And uh, M13 is quite a beautiful sight to see. And it's a little more than just all of those stars. And there's a lot of great descriptions as to you know what those stars look like. One of my personal favorites to uh, tell people is it looks like somebody just uh, spilt salt on a black tablecloth. And, uh, you know, I, I just, it's so fun to look at. I always try to train telescopes on it no matter what. And the 17 here is absolutely uh, perfect for objects like this. Uh, but M13 here is actually an object that you should be able to see uh, with relative ease with a lot of uh, different telescopes you can get off of Amazon or really any cheap telescope anywhere. And now uh, we do have a question. What is the lowest altitude we could go to? Um, it seems to be about 10 degrees-ish. So, you know, it, it does give us a lot of room to work with, but at the same time, it does restrict us with just a little bit of the night sky. Um, and as far as Jupiter and Saturn go, well, unfortunately, they are in the southeast right now, and uh, they are just kind of in the trees. They will be rising a little bit later from our uh, perspective here. Uh, but for now, to tie us over, we have a uh, request for Albirio. Would like to see Albirio. And now Albirio is just an amazing location to see in Cygnus. And as the next exposure will take us right to it. There we go. Just bumping up. The exposure a little bit and zooming in. Albirio here being a binary star system is very, very beautiful. It has a nice uh, dynamic between it as far as colors go, in my opinion. The, the blue and the red just really do stand out. It's a very, very beautiful uh, thing to see with, uh, again, a really, really nice telescope that you can just get anywhere. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but uh, the views do rely upon whether or not your uh, telescope can reach that level of magnification here with the 17 inch, we're able to get some nice detail. And the diffraction spikes as well make both of these stars look like uh, shimmering diamonds in the sky. They're quite something. And wow, that little edit there with the exposure time is bringing a lot of uh, the background out into view, uh, which is also very incredible itself. I'm not too sure whether or not it can become a little bit more sharp, but with that exposure, uh, we might just have to see what we can get and uh, just play with the cards that we've been dealt. Uh, nevertheless, there is Albirio for us. And uh, yes, the Sombrero Galaxy is viewable tonight. So we will be going there next. Now the Sombrero Galaxy is uh, just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful spiral galaxy. And we're looking at it almost edge on. As soon as uh, the exposure here is taken, we will be able to see what is just a really neat galaxy. And it has a pretty nice story to it that actually pertains to Lowell Observatory itself in that our buddy Vesto Slifer, who was working at the observatory doing his own research in spectroscopy, uh, used galaxies like the Sombrero here to help determine that, well, something wasn't right with the universe that we, uh, that we knew. And that was, you know, the night sky was beautiful and it was littered with objects that we all assumed to be within our own Milky Way galaxy. And now that's incredible in its own right, but it wasn't correct. And we didn't know this quite yet. Nobody really knew this quite yet. But these objects that were, uh, you know, disky that didn't really look like any of the other nebulae, those other gaseous structures out there, uh, nobody had the idea yet that, uh, well, uh, people did have the idea. They were kind of forming it. Uh, but nobody could say for certain that these were outside of our Milky Way. And uh, with 
work done by Vesto Slifer and uh, also people like Edwin Hubble, it was uh, seen through uh, dissecting the light that these objects gave off uh, that these galaxies were being pushed away by some unknown force away from us uh, in the form of redshifting. And uh, the sombrero here was doing ju uh, just that. Um, nowadays, we know that the universe is expanding, or at least that's our best model as of right now. Uh, whichever way that go, whichever way that goes, we'll we'll just have to wait. But yeah, the Sombrero Galaxy is uh, just absolutely stunning. No matter how you see it, when you see it, or uh, where you see it. So uh, yeah. Next up, we have another request, another fun object that's actually in my list tonight. Uh, the Black Eye Galaxy, M64. Now, I'm not too sure whether or not that is up quite yet, but it looks like it is. There we go. It's been a while since I've seen the night sky, this lockdown. It's really something. And a question from Anna. Uh, what's it like to work at Lowell? It's amazing. It's fun. Uh, I do miss working with the public. It was really something to just uh, talk to people, really get to know people, and uh, you know, see what their favorite things were about space, about Lowell. Um, because hearing everybody's uh, you know opinions about what we were seeing that night, or uh, you know, trying to get everybody's perspective as to why they were there, uh, really was what made it fun. Besides just sharing a, a nice little uh, common interest with everybody else there. And now M64 in view, the Black Eye Galaxy. This is just quite a beautiful view as well. And this uh, spiral galaxy with a little bit of just a dark dust lane through it um, is another one of these uh, Messier objects. I really do like looking at this galaxy uh, because it almost looks out of place. This really bright and, and really dense nucleus of stars uh, that just kind of brightens up the entire surroundings is more or less just uh, confined into that, that beautiful dusty lane that we could all see from here. And if we want to zoom in on that dusty lane, we could actually see um, that there is like this, this little graininess to it. There's a lot of detail, a lot of fine detail with uh, this uh, with with this galaxy that we're able to see from down here. Um, and well, got some more questions in chats uh, from Vincent. Uh, how do winds affect images from space? Well, for, for us, uh, the winds really just blow around the telescope. It makes it a little bit harder to uh, stably get a, a, a photograph. Um, but right now it looks like that uh, the weather is doing us quite well. And that's good. I'm really hoping that it stays that way because I would like to take some more photos. And now we have another request. Algeba. Algeba. And we're going to be just uh, swooshing on over to Algeba here. Little tiny star right there in the center just flickering mess with the exposure just a little bit more to try to get as much detail as possible and try to see uh, that little system there. Uh, the stars are pretty close together and it's almost just a, uh, almost just bringing a lot of color out. It's bringing a lot of color out. It's, it's a very, very pretty object, um, but that's kind of the best we could do with uh, the detail that we have and a little bit of turbulence that there is. But again, Algeba, really cool object, really cool star system. And now, the next request from Catherine, M57, the Ring Nebula. We will be going there next. Uh, this is another fun object. This is on my list. I love to see this through telescopes because there is surprisingly a lot of color that you can get, that you can develop through this, or not really develop, but see uh, with any ground-based telescope, any ground based optical telescope that you that you may have. And now this is a beautiful planetary nebula in the constellation of Lyra. And um, why it's one of my favorites besides the color is just being able to uh, really tell the story as to how the star lived its life. Now M57 is about 2,283 light years away from home, which is a decent distance. It's definitely no road trip. 
Uh, but being a planetary nebula means that it's really just uh, dispersed throughout this region of space. So again, that's just a rough estimate of distance and any distance in space is entirely a rough, uh, rough estimate anyways. Um, but a planetary nebula is, uh, as you can see right there in the center, there is a little tiny blue dot. Uh, that there is, I believe, the white dwarf of M57 itself, uh, the defunct core of what was once upon a time a star much like our own sun. And now stars, they live out their own lives, and uh, they tend to follow whatever path fits them the best. And, uh, well, depending on what star you have, depending on how massive this star may be, it might live out a different lifestyle. Now, something like our sun, our own sun, is uh, not, you know, it's not an incredibly impressive star as far as the mass goes, uh, but it does die, just like really anything in the universe, period. Living out a life of uh, just creating this heat, light, and energy to uh, disperse throughout its own local neighborhood and pretty much the entire universe um, allows for this, this fuel in itself to be used up. And eventually, it, it really can't, uh, can't keep working anymore, so it ends up just, uh, well, dying out. Uh, but unlike a uh, supernova, which, you know, would be a much more massive star's death, uh, this stellar death isn't something that's, you know, quite as spectacular. It's, it's not as uh, ridiculous. It's not as violent. It's not as bright. It's just something that happens, and, well, you know, that star that was just incredibly massive and couldn't really hold itself together anymore would just shut off its... its its outer layers right out into space and create something as beautiful as the ring nebula here. Um, so let's go up just a little bit here to our next request. A request for M97, the Owl Nebula. Now, just got to wait this out here. Uh, the Owl Nebula itself is a, another one of these planetary nebulae that's located just around 2,000 light years away from home. And it is uh, just within the constellation of our little buddy, or really just our, uh, our big buddy, Ursa Major. Once it uh, kind of just stops taking this uh, mid-transportation photo, we'll get a little bit better of an image here. And now the Owl Nebula being one of these planetary nebulae again follows under something similar to what was with M57. And uh, as you can see right there in the center, just that little uh, blue dot appears to be the white dwarf star that would be a part or really a component of this planetary nebula. And uh, being only 2000 or so light years away from home makes this an object that, you know, is it's far enough but it's also close enough that we're able to see a, a nice amount of detail, this, this blue haziness of, of gas and dust uh, that just really makes images like this uh, vibrant and pop. And so uh, from Claire, can you show the Eagle Nebula? Um, if it is high enough, I think we should be able to get the Eagle Nebula here. It, it looks like it is actually, um, but we'll give that a shot. Let me see, we can try. We'll try our best, Claire, we'll try our best. Eagle Nebula is cool. It is just a beautifully dispersed uh, uh, nebulae just outside of Sagittarius. And uh, it's more or less towards where the band of our Milky Way galaxy would be, something that you could really see during the summer. It just looks absolutely beautiful. Um, and it is coming through quite nicely. Now, the Eagle, of, or the Eagle Nebula is uh, something that a lot of people are familiar with, but not in a way that you would uh, traditionally see. As uh, we're zooming in here, we're seeing some structures, these gaseous towers that just, uh, you know, absolutely just cut through space itself. And uh, they are often photographed and uh, put on literally any computer desktop anywhere. They are known as the Pillars of Creation, very, very beautiful structures within the Eagle Nebula that just really are like uh, 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 just otherworldly. They're unlike anything else that, that a lot of people could see. And uh, again, a really beautiful object, one of my favorites to see if you're able to zoom in like this and uh, really see them. Now I have a question here. 
what's my favorite object in the summer sky? Uh, truth be told, my favorite object in the summer sky would 100%, without a doubt, have to be the Swan Nebula. It was something that was showcased in uh, last week, I believe, last week's um, interactive stargazing. And uh, actually, we can do that. We can go right there. The Swan Nebula is uh, really something. It, it's it's another one of these nebulae that are out there, and it's it's really near the Eagle Nebula. Um, but it's it has its own structure that almost just looks more outstanding than a lot of the nebulae that seem to be uh, relatively close to it. That's just my opinion, though. Uh, but it looks you know, like this fire. It's it's really something. It's amazing. And uh, what makes it so fun to see is not only just the immense amount of detail uh, that is is present, uh, but, you know, a lot of just the, the rich history behind it, the, the early research that if I, you know, went into it, probably take a very long time. It's uh, traditionally known as the Omega Nebula. This is something that whenever you're looking for a listing of it, you know, if you're trying to look for like a Wikipedia article or on Stellarium, I believe it's known as the Omega Nebula. Um, but it is just something that's, uh, you know, incredibly beautiful. And it's uh, it's pretty sizable. It's about 15 or so light years in diameter, if I remember correctly. And um, it sits at about 6,000 or so light years away from our home. Uh, it's just something else. And this here is probably one of my favorite things to look at during the summer, just because of how vibrant it is. And compared to a lot of these different objects, which are vibrant, don't get me wrong, very beautiful. Um, but this here just has, it's such a unique structure in my mind. And uh, seeing what this nebula looks like, it kind of reminds me of like, you know, a fire or really just like a campfire that has been, you know, set in this uh, relaxing place in the Pacific Northwest where you're just enjoying your summer and having fun. And, and right now more than ever, you know, I really do miss being outside and, and really having, having fun. So seeing something like the Swan Nebula just kind of uh, takes me back to uh, different summers and being a summer object just makes it that much more um, intertwined with it. So our next location we're gonna go to is the Dumbbell Nebula. And now this is another beautiful planetary nebula that is really, really nice to photograph, very easy uh, to see. And once we take this exposure, you will see what I am talking about. There we go. So the Dumbbell Nebula, it, it, it is one of those rare few objects that actually sort of resembles what it's named after. And a little bit later, I'll uh, kind of show you all something that's on my list if uh, nobody suggests it. That has a name that just doesn't really fit properly. And uh, well, the, Dumb uh, the Dumbbell Nebula here is um, an emission nebula, another planetary nebula. It kind of lives the same story as something like uh, the Owl or, uh, or the Ring Nebula but it, it, it does have a different shape. It has a different structure to it that you can see. And uh, the nice thing about these planetary nebulae is that there's such a great variety of them that you can kind of look uh, b between each one and see uh, how the structures change, what actually changes in between them. And um, if we're able to maybe just uh, mess around with some of the, uh, the gamma here, we might be able to make some portions of it a little bit more vibrant. Uh, it's always just up to uh, whether or not the, the city lights over in that direction wants to cooperate, um, which, there we go. Makes it a little bit nicer. Just, I love showing everybody nice pictures. I love having everybody just see these beautiful images of different objects in the night sky. And uh, yeah, dumbbell, amazing. Uh, so next up on our request list is M3. And we will take a peek at that next. Right there. This is another one of those globular star clusters, something similar to M13, which is again, one of my favorite objects to look in the night sky. Definitely not my absolute favorite, uh, but still one of my favorites. 
And uh, these globular star clusters, again, are collections of hundreds of thousands of stars just all kind of coalescing into this globular shape out just uh, in the outreaches of our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, M3 here is uh, just, it's phenomenal. Again, a lot of these globular star clusters are really, really nice to image, as you can really see the uh, dispersion of all of those stars, all of those hundreds of thousands of stars. And uh, this is, again, a part of the constellation, uh, or a part of the uh, catalog, rather, um, by Charles Messier, just to uh, identify objects that are not comets. So up next, we have another request for M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. And now M51 is another neat object to see. It is not just one galaxy, but two. This is a, one of the rare cases in our night sky of uh, literal galactic cannibalism. And now this is uh, a strange term used for just uh, galaxies combining together, or really just interacting with each other in a way that you know their gravitational influence on each other is uh, more or less allowing them to become one. And a lot of galactic clusters, these little clumps of galaxies, including uh, something like our own Milky Way and uh, the Andromeda Galaxy, uh, do eventually succumb to this pull. But this here, the Whirlpool Galaxy, is more or less a snapshot of what is to come in the very, very far future. And now the Whirlpool here, M51, is uh, pretty far away from home compared to these other objects we've been looking at, but similar to the other galaxies that we have seen and that they are, uh, well, tens of millions of light years away. In the case of M51, this is sitting at about 23 million light years away in distance. And, uh, well, another request for something uh, near the same constellation of Ursa Major M82 known as the Cigar Galaxy. We will be going there next. And now this is something that can be seen during uh, multiple times during the year, uh, mostly because uh, the constellations more towards the northern part of the sky are all constellations that seem to, uh, well, not move as quickly as something directly, directly ahead of you. Uh, these are some uh, beautiful objects to look at as far as uh, the Messier objects go. Uh, but M82 is something that has always carried a little bit of mystery to it. A lot of the times when you see something in the night sky that has a remote disk shape, you can do your best to assume what it is. And uh, in the past, a lot of scientists would look at galaxies like this and label them as something that you know they could try to understand then and there. But uh, later research and later studies would show that uh, a lot of objects out there weren't exactly as they seemed. And M82 here is uh, one of those examples of galaxies that, you know, it kind of looks, uh, looks familiar. It looks like something that you would be used to seeing in the night sky. But again, it's, it's not exactly as it seems. M82 also has that name, the Cigar Galaxy, because when looking at it through a telescope, I guess it looks like a cigar. I uh, wouldn't be able to tell you because I am the least creative person on uh, the entire Earth. Uh, but this galaxy and its partner, M81, which is just out of frame, uh, sits approximately 11 and a half million light years away from home. Uh, this galaxy here went through multiple phases of, of I guess, conventions, of, of what it was called, of what it was labeled. And it would start off with uh, different labels that uh, kind of went around the whole spiral uh, galaxy side of the catalog. Uh, but these days, we know it to be something more along the lines of a non-Magellanic irregular galaxy, or really just a galaxy that doesn't fit any uh, classification that we have, any formal classification that we currently have set for a majority of the galaxies out there. And now what makes this galaxy so interesting and what actually allowed that classification to be uh, more or less set uh, was this little bit of haziness, this cloudiness that you might be able to see just around the core of the galaxy itself. If we bump up the exposure just a tad bit, we might be able to capture a little bit more of it. But it is fairly difficult to see, uh, not only because of distance, but also, uh, well, it's just a, it's a little bit red. And reds don't really come through all too well unless they are incredibly illuminated, such as just near the core there, that little bit of red is popping out um, because the air, our atmosphere, does not like that color. 
Um, but this gaseous substance that seems to surround M82 here is uh, this blanket of star forming material. And so uh, you're almost getting this uh, baby boom in this galaxy where a lot of baby stars are being born at quite an incredible rate, something that would absolutely shatter records, something that you wouldn't really see with any other galaxy out there uh, in such a way that is occurring on M82. Now, there are locations in different galaxies where star formation is absolutely ramped up, uh, but M82 takes the cake, and, and that, that, that dustiness in it, that starburst region it's known as, uh, does take the cake for just producing as many stars as it does. And so, Let's see, the antennae galaxies. Uh, these are just outside of Corvus. I've actually never gotten the chance to see them through the Malincam here, but I have been able to see them personally on you know, multiple websites, as a lot of people have. And uh, they are very fun objects to look at. And this is, again, kind of harkening back to something like the Whirlpool Galaxy um, in that if we're able to see them, uh, they are galaxies interacting with each other. And again, another snapshot into the far future uh, where our galaxy and something like Andromeda would be colliding. And now galaxies like this are, are really fun to understand simply because of, of that reason, of uh, them being a snapshot. And not only seeing the interactions between these galaxies and seeing what actually happens, uh, but really just seeing the process take place in our current moment in time. You know, it's going to be millions and millions and millions of years before we see any major ch uh, changes in our night sky, anything that, you know, would uh, remotely resemble interactions on this scale. Uh, but looking out in the direction of Corvus and, and seeing these galaxies interact with each other in such a way that it's this, this apparent, this obvious, um, really just allows people to, to wonder, allows scientists to wonder, allows people who just uh, see these photographs, people who are joining me to, to just look at these pretty photos, uh, to wonder you know, what it may be like in our far future. And now these events do look quite dangerous. Uh, they look really scary. I mean, collisions aren't exactly something that a whole lot of people are really comfortable with, because who would be? And uh, at a galactic scale, you know, something so massive, something so large, colliding with another thing that's so massive and so large, uh, sounds pretty scary on paper. Uh, but in practice, you know, not a whole lot happens. Space being as vast and as ridiculously, uh, not really empty, uh, but, you know, lacking a lot of, like, stuff, I guess, um, makes it so that not a whole lot of, of objects, not a whole lot of things like planets, uh, comets, or whatever, stars, are, are going to, you know, hit each other. But rather you know, will pass by, will interact, things will change. Uh, but as far as the collisions go, it's mostly just uh, uh, something we see from out here, something we see uh, looking in. Um, and uh, no matter what, it's, it's always really pretty. So next up, we have another request for something that is, again, on my list, the Trifid Nebula. It is very, very pretty. Um, we will be going there next. And now the Trifid is about 5,200 light years away from home. And uh, the Trifid is actually pretty interesting in that it is a, a combination of different things, a, a star cluster, an emission nebula. And uh, well, as soon as we see it here, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. It, it looks like a hodgepodge of, of gases and dust with a very, very beautiful and vibrant colors attached. To it. Now it is uh, local to Sagittarius, and uh, there it is. Trifid is absolutely phenomenal. And again, it is local to Sagittarius, uh, which is a constellation that is or a really kind of a, a home for a lot of these uh, nebula structures. As looking towards the constellation of Sagittarius, you're almost looking inwards towards the Milky Way galaxy, seeing uh, more density, seeing more objects, uh, not only forming, but existing, coexisting. And uh, the Trifid Nebula here is exactly just uh, another one of those objects out there. It's, it's a phenomenal destination for amateur astronomers, and it, it really does bring a lot of beauty to the table as far as photographs go. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just a whole lot of fun to look at. And now a question. 
why are there red lights at the observatory? We use red lights up at the observatory, up at Lowell, to uh, really help everybody there. It, it might seem a little uh, counterintuitive because if you want to see where you're going, you want white light. You want to be able to see to the best of your ability where you're going. But trust me, if you're outside long enough, just uh, in the darkness, letting your eyes adjust, it's actually really nice and, and, and really easy, provided you're, you're able to uh, see things all around you. And um, once your eyes adjust, that white light that once upon a time may have been helpful for you immediately becomes destructive. You almost blind yourself. And that blindness uh, carries over to when you look through a telescope. Anytime you're peeking through a telescope, you want to be able to have your eyes uh, be as adjusted as possible to the night sky so that you're able to see these beautiful colors such as uh you know what we're seeing here at the trifid nebula you probably wouldn't exactly see all these reds and, and the blues and a little bit of greens but uh nevertheless you would still see uh color you would see detail and if your eyes weren't adjusted or if you immediately just blinded yourself with some white light uh, you wouldn't be able to see as much detail uh as you know you would be if you just let your eyes adjust and we use those red lights to uh aid people in their walking so that they're able to uh you know, just relax a little bit, adjust, and then eventually find their way around the observatory. And uh, really helps us educators as well as being up there for uh, a nice little stints during the night, allows our eyes to adjust quite nicely. So, you know, if we were to see some white light, it would, it would probably not only just uh, scare us, but hurt. So we have another request for M63. Now, M63 is uh, known as the Sunflower Galaxy. And this is another beautiful destination. It's another beautiful galaxy out there. It, it does live up to its name. It does look like a giant sunflower in the sky. It's um, provided it looks like a giant to you. And this is, again, another one of the uh, Messier cataloged objects. And now once the exposure runs through once again, we might be able to catch, uh, hopefully, M63 in a little bit of its glory. And there it is, just right in the center there. Now this galaxy is pretty far away. It's about 30 million light years away from home. And uh, seeing it right there in the center actually uh, is quite impressive. It does brighten up its surroundings a little bit more than you would expect objects that far away too. Uh, but galaxies being these fantastic clumps of you know, stars, uh, dust, and gas uh, allows illumination to really travel. And M63 here is definitely just another one of those galaxies that are uh, very beautiful, very fun to look at. So our next request. Can we go down to M24, just below M20? We'll see if we can do that. This is a nice little open star cluster, if I remember correctly, just outside of Sagittarius. And if it is high enough, we will see a little bit of it. If it's not, then we'll either see a tree or nothing. So let's hope that it's the former and that we see something. And we'll figure it out as soon as this exposure takes its way through. It's too low. Well, darn. Our buddy here, actually, there we go. It came out pretty Okay, it looked to be too low at first. Um, this little bit of yellow haziness that that does seem to uh, cake the image is from the city lights, as this is low towards the eastern horizon, uh, which is just in the direction of downtown Flagstaff, uh, where the lights are dampened. There's not a whole lot of light pollution, but you know there definitely is enough whenever you are running an 11 second exposure on a 17 inch telescope, such as what we are using. And to address something real quick, uh, I actually was planning to try to see Centaurus A this evening, but unfortunately it is just too low on the horizon and just by a few degrees that uh, at that, just too low on the horizon for the 17 inch uh, to, to properly image. So it looks like that we've uh, gotten through some of these requests and on to a question. Is a telescope actually moving to the location? And the answer is yes. Our 17-inch 
plane wave telescope, which has a camera attached to it, is uh, currently just slewing throughout the night sky to whatever object we like to put it to, whatever anybody requests, whatever is on my list. Uh, we are we are moving the telescope and positioning it for a photograph on that set location and uh, doing our very best to take a photo. Now another question, are those shooting stars in the image? Uh, those are not. The telescope is just taking an image while it's moving. So uh, even though it does look really cool, they're not shooting stars. They're just uh, stars that look like they're moving. And it looks like Yes, the lagoon. The lagoon nebula is quite beautiful and it is on my list as well. And I'm very excited to see this, uh, in fact. It is a, another one of these nebulae about 4,077 light years away from home. It is uh, one of the many star forming nebulae in the Northern Hemisphere, but it's only one of the two star forming regions uh, that could be uh, fairly visible with no assistance. Uh, this is another one of those nebulae near uh, the, the constellation of Sagittarius towards the uh, inner portions of our Milky Way galaxy. And uh, it does have its own kind of surreal beauty to it with just the depth that you can see within the, uh, the darkness and even the color itself as well. Uh, the lagoon is, it's pretty fun to look at it it is up there on my list of of fun objects that i love to see uh, but depending on you know what time of year it is uh you know during the summer midsummer is is usually the best time to view this and prior to moving up to flagstaff you know i was in a really hot environment so going out during the midsummer and trying to see something like the lagoon was was always kind of tricky um but it, it definitely does uh, make it worth it but you know, seeing something like the swan again, going back to that, which is my personal favorite object in the night sky, is is really something else. And I would trek through literally anything to catch a view of that. So I will be switching on over our view here to M11. Yeah, actually, that was exactly what I was planning, the wild duck cluster. And now a lot of objects out there in the sky are unnamed. And for good reason, you know, you have a limited amount of things you could call uh, these these stars, these these stellar formations, these stellar objects. And as far as the wild duck cluster goes, as far as that um, that name has come about, I have no idea. I don't exactly see a duck when I look in this cluster, uh, but it is a beautiful open star cluster about 6,100 light years away or so. And uh, it was discovered in 1681 and then later added to the Messier catalog to be a part of those objects that totally weren't comets. And uh, a question that actually could pertain to something like this, uh, how is the telescope taking pictures? Now we have a Malin cam, which is a type of uh, astrophotography camera attached to the back of this telescope, which is doing long exposure photos of whatever we want to see in the night sky. In this case, we're, uh, we are looking at M11, also the wild duck cluster. And again, it's a very beautiful object to see, um, but as far as uh, what the name goes, you know, no idea. My coworkers are relentless with the questions. I, yeah, I, I, I know, I know. It, it's a never-ending uh, waterfall of, of questions and and uh, requests that totally, totally do exist. And uh, I guess next up. We could take a nice little visit on to, uh, you know what, let's go to M81. M81 can be kind of our uh, spot to end things off or really just start to wrap things up if there are no more further requests. And now this is the companion to something that we saw earlier, M82, uh, a very, very beautiful galaxy uh, residing out there uh, towards Ursa Major. Now question, is space flat or curved? That is a loaded question. There, there is a lot to unpack with that simple question. As a matter of like what the geometrical uh, shape or the geometrical makeup of something like our universe could be, that is still to this day on the table. So as far as, as me answering that question for you, I guess time could tell. 
um, it, it will take a while and a lot of research to try to you know, answer something like this. Uh, but it is a fun question to uh, try to unearth as, you know, our universe is awesome. There's a lot to it that we don't know, and that's what makes it so interesting. That's what makes it so fun to take photos and to understand more um, and, and look at things uh, such as what we have here in view, M81, known as Bode's Nebula or the Bode's Galaxy, the Bode's Galaxy, Bode's Galaxy. And this is, again, a companion to something we saw earlier, M82, the Cigar Galaxy. Both reside at about 11 and a half million light years away from home. And this is something that is a little bit more familiar to us as far as galaxies go. Again, M82 was a peculiar galaxy. It wasn't something that necessarily fell under a classification um, that you know a lot of other galaxies would fall under. Uh, rather, M81 here is uh, one of those galaxies exactly. It's a beautiful spiral galaxy uh, that does exist pretty far away from home. And as you can see, just on the edges of the, uh, the galaxy there, when we uh, brighten it up just a little bit, there is some structure to it, almost this S-like shape that seems to uh, uh, make up just the beauty of M81. Now, can we see black holes through the telescope? This is another question. Uh, unfortunately, no, we cannot see black holes through this telescope. But an array of telescopes that is being used currently by the Event Horizon Telescope team are doing their very best to image black holes, such as uh, the black hole that was imaged in the center of the galaxy, M87, uh, known now as M87 star. And now, Another request, Alpharetz. I always have a hard time uh, pronouncing that, but unfortunately, Alpharetz is not up quite yet from our perspective here in Flagstaff. And um, as a request here, can we see Napoleon's hat? Now, yeah, I get that. That's funny. And now, can we see any star close to our system? Um, well, it depends. There are a lot of stars that are out there towards our, uh, or I guess relative to our, our little sun here, um, but it would really depend on what star we would like to see. Uh, as the closest stars to us uh, tend to be stars that are pretty easy to see, uh, but nevertheless, you know, uh, we would have to kind of look through a catalog or you'd have to give me something specific uh, depending on you know what star you would like to see as something you know close-ish to us and uh no dad the andromeda galaxy is not visible unfortunately and uh well scrolling through to see if we have any other requests um, I am good to wrap if everybody else is good to wrap. We'll give it just a few more seconds. We'll have a nice little still here of the M81 and I will just continue talking and really just recapping all of the stuff that we have seen tonight. And uh, tonight it seemed to be pretty beautiful out. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of wind, surprisingly, as far as our images went, but earlier on in the evening, there seemed to be a, a, a ton of wind. It almost looked uh, a little bit sketchy, uh, but nevertheless, we were able to power through it and get some very, very uh, beautiful uh, photos. And now uh, M102. That seems to be something that is just requested here. Now, M102 in the Messier catalog, I do believe that is up. It's, uh, I guess, more commonly known under the NGC tag, I believe, but M102 is um, just a beautiful place to look at no matter what. Let's see. It's the Spindle Galaxy, I believe it's called. Uh, and we're looking at it almost just from the side perfectly from the side, like you're looking at a dinner plate. Um, it's a wild view when we're able to get it here. And uh, I was able to image it actually a little bit earlier uh, this year, I believe. Uh, it's uh, just in the constellation Draco. And uh, once it takes this photo, yes, okay, that, that does look quite nice. We'll have to wait a couple of seconds for everything to stabilize just a little bit to see if uh, we can get a little bit more detail. But M102 here is... Um, it's another pretty thing to see in the night sky. It is uh, 
another galaxy again. So it's going to be an incredible distance away from home. And uh, that distance is still kind of thought about, I believe. I, I think this object here is about 50 million light years away from our Earth. Uh, so it, it is very far away and uh, relatively faint, but you can see the dark lane just stretch right across the, the beautiful core there in the image on stream. We'll have to run the exposure just a, uh, a little while longer. And uh, there we go, it dimmed out just a little bit, doesn't really wash itself out whenever you mess around with the exposure. Really, uh, you don't want it to wash itself out because yeah, everybody wants detail and uh, M102 being so far away and um, and just uh, so beautiful, you want as much detail as possible. And now we have another request for NGC 4889. And now this here, I believe, is a uh, one of those elliptical galaxies something that we actually started the stream off with and we'll be traveling there just right now and now elliptical galaxies are incredibly massive and also incredibly beautiful they're really cool to look at but when you first see them through any telescope or really just image them at all uh, they don't look all too crazy because again they are just like these these blobs in space these glowing objects out there uh, that contain uh, just a nauseating amount of stars. These elliptical galaxies tend to be the elders of our universe. They're, they're galaxies that have uh, long since gone through many processes and, and, and maybe even things like combinations that uh, we had seen previous to this image here uh, to create these incredibly large and these incredibly massive uh, galactic set pieces. And uh, this galaxy here is definitely no stranger to being so huge, so massive, and, and it's just so crazy. As it sits at a distance at around like 300 million light years away, it's, it is a ridiculous distance away from home. And uh, just around it in this little local cluster are a slew of other smaller galaxies, other little galaxies, or even galaxies similar in size, but just pretty far away. And uh, there's no better way to really end off this stream, to end off uh, everything that has been done tonight, all these beautiful photos that have been taken uh, with an image like this. Even though the clarity isn't something that, you know, is is amazing and you know leaves a lot to be desired um, because these objects are so far away. Uh, there is a lot in this image that exists at, at more of a level than would be previously thought. If you were to just look at this image at a base at, at a base level at, at base expectations, uh, you would just see a whole bunch of dots, and you could think they're stars. They're just a lot of uh, little things out there, um, maybe nothing important. But a lot of these little dots are a part of just a larger supercluster of galaxies that all contain millions of stars, billions of stars, so many stars that counting them just becomes uh, ridiculous. And every structure is something that we can do our best, you know, scientists can do our best to uh, uh, understand a little bit more about. So we know the dynamics of them. In turn, we start to learn more about the dynamics of our own universe. So uh, thank you all for joining this evening. I'm, I'm happy that everyone here was able to at least uh, try to see some objects. We did our best with some of the uh, objects that were lower towards the horizon. And unfortunately, the other objects that were not visible uh, will not be getting to probably anytime soon unless they will be rising. Uh, but you know, given another time, and uh, hopefully when all of this craziness is going over, uh, we will be using telescopes up at the Goto and hopefully in future streams like this to not only take images, but share them uh, with everybody in the public and uh, well, everybody visiting. So again, thank you all for tuning in. Have a fantastic rest of your nights and uh, have fun. Be safe. <laughs>